1997 Royal Rumble was held in San Antonio, Texas on the 19th of January 1997. Around 60,000 fans packed the Alamo Dome to see hometown hero Shawn Michaels try to win back the WWF Championship against Psycho Sid in the main event, and fans would also see the 30-man Royal Rumble match featuring stars of the WWF and a few competitors from the AAA promotion. The amount of fans who attended the Royal Rumble is quite surprising when you consider the WWF were having trouble selling out Raw venues in late 1996. It's incredible to see a crowd of around 60,000 people like this when business was so down and when the television ratings were so bad in comparison to WCW Monday Nitro. But competitive prices, family discounts and comp tickets helped out a lot here. The Alamo Dome in San Antonio, Texas looked good on TV and it gave the impression that fans were eager to see the event, so it's a win-win really. If perception is reality, then the perception was that the WWF could fill up a dome venue with over 60,000 fans. The free for all show featured the quote mini wrestlers in a tag team bout, and we had a mini Mankind and mini Vader competing inside the ring. La Parquita also competed in this tag team match, a mini version of La Parca, who by this time had signed a deal with WCW. Our opening match is for the Intercontinental Championship, Goldust challenges Triple H. This feud began back at the In Your House 12 It's Time Free For All when it looked like Hunter tried to make a pass at Marlena. The video package before the match puts forward a question to viewers at home. Is Triple H really attracted to Marlena or is he doing this to provoke Goldust? Goldust's character at this point really lacked what made him so controversial just a year prior. The gimmick had been getting toned down since the summer of 1996 and by turning Goldust into a babyface, a lot of things that made the character interesting to watch had been taken away. Triple H meanwhile has a new heater saying as the Mr. Perfect thing didn't work out. Mr. Hughes, Hunter's butler, escorts Helmsley to the ring and yeah, this wouldn't last long. A certain female superstar was going to debut in a matter of weeks and Triple H would end up with a much more interesting bodyguard. Goldust attacks during Helmsley's entrance and we get a great shot of the venue as the action gets inside the ropes. Goldust throws Hunter out of the ring and Triple H gets dropped on the guardrail and when the action resumes inside the ropes, Goldust goes for 10 punches in the corner. Hunter gets out by performing an inverted atomic drop and he tries to end it with a pedigree but a slingshot counter sends Hunter to the outside once again. Goldust then drops the ring steps across Hunter's back, Mr. Hughes does absolutely nothing, and the referee also allows the match to continue. Goldust continues to use the steps to gain an advantage, but it's all for nothing. Triple H manages to snap Goldust's nag across the top rope, and Hunter then goes on offense inside the ring. It doesn't take long before we go back to the outside again when Triple H lands a double axe handle. Hunter keeps the pressure on by throwing Goldust into the ring post, but Goldust manages to dodge a knee strike and Hunter crashes hard into the guardrail. Goldust again goes back to using the steps before the match resumes inside the ropes, and from here the bizarre one begins targeting Triple H's knee and leg. Goldust applies a figure 4 in the middle of the ring. The steps once again come into play when Triple H takes a knee breaker, and Jim Ross says that this might as well be a non-sanctioned match at this point. The flow of the match has been really strange too. Not too long after both competitors get back in the ring, they end up back on the outside where they fight at the guardrails and again they use the ring steps. Even more strange is referee Earl Hebner grabbing Marlene's chair when Hunter was about to use it as a weapon. It just doesn't make any sense. As the match continues on, Todd Pettengill interviews country singer Colin Ray because this is exactly what WWF fans of 1997 want to see. Pettengill even gets Colin to yeah, sing. Which one? Little Rock. I think I'm on a roll here in San Antonio. It's, it's <laughs> it's the word. Triple H drops a knee on Goldust and he remembers to sail the other knee after hitting the move. Goldust then fires back with a clothesline as Jim Ross admits on commentary that this has been a strange match. The challenger then goes to the top rope, but Hunter manages to crotch his opponent on the turnbuckles. Goldust then reverses a superplex attempt, but his follow-up elbow drop completely misses its target. Curtis Hughes passes the IC title to Triple H, but instead of immediately using the belt as a weapon, Hunter decides to give Marlena a kiss. 
Goldust wakes up, he grabs the belt and he uses it on Hunter, but Mr. Hughes saves Hunter from getting pinned. While the referee and Goldust are distracted by Mr. Hughes and as Goldust pushes Marlene's cigar onto Hunter's butler, Triple H jumps back into the ring and Goldust takes a hard clothesline. We then see the pedigree and Triple H successfully defends his Intercontinental Championship. This one was quite physical, but it's also quite messy. The unconventional style of the match was a risk and I don't really think it paid off. It was pretty underwhelming. We go backstage and Bret Hart says he knows he's a marked man tonight, but that's nothing new. One man is going to be left standing in the ring tonight, and Bret Hart says it's going to be the excellence of execution. We then go to the boiler room where Mankind says most people see the Royal Rumble as a step towards the World Wrestling Federation Championship, whereas Mrs Foley's baby boy sees the Royal Rumble as an opportunity to hurt a lot of people he doesn't like. Ahmed Johnson's huge push after debuting in the World Wrestling Federation led him to the Intercontinental Championship. A ruptured kidney put a halt to Ahmed's rise to the top and he was forced to vacate the IC title. To explain his injury, Farouk attacked Ahmed Johnson on WWF Raw and Johnson was taken off TV, though upon his return, Ahmed made it clear that he wanted revenge. Johnson made his in-ring return on Shotgun Saturday Night in a match against Crush, and this match here with Farouk would serve as Ahmed's in-ring return on pay per view. There was a decent amount of heat here with this rivalry brewing up since July of 1997, so let's see if they could capitalise. Thankfully, this one was booked more like a fight than a wrestling match. Ahmed destroys Farouk with a ton of right hands right at the opening bell, and Farouk takes a beating on the outside. Johnson then kicks Farouk as the nation leader crawls on the mat, and the crowd reaction here compared to Goldust vs Helmsley is like night and day. The audience breaks out in a loud Ahmed chant as the match continues on. Farouk targets the kidney area and this slows Ahmed down for a moment. A member of the Nation of Domination passes Farouk a belt but Ahmed dodges the attack, leading to Johnson taking control of the belt and Farouk gets whipped over and over again. The referee lets it slide. I I'm not complaining by the way, it fits the match. But it's a bit odd how the rules are being thrown out the window during the first two matches of the Royal Rumble. And also, this has to be intentional. With the introduction of Shotgun Saturday Night the week prior and just the overall tone of the WWF's programming over these past few weeks, you can tell the company was trying to get a little more gritty and this is something that's going to continue throughout the year. Anyway, the match spills to the outside again where Nation member D'Lo Brown gets thrown into Ahmed. D'Lo was just a no-named lackey of Farouk at this point who took bumps, but thankfully, we'd get to see his talents inside the ring very soon. Farouk then drops Ahmed across a chair while still targeting the kidneys. I thought this looked good because it looked believable. The referee then allows Farouk to swing the chair and nail Johnson on the back, and the nation's leader continues to target the kidneys when the match gets back inside the ropes. Farouk has managed to get a good amount of heat here and the targeted attack has worked well in terms of getting the live audience a little invested. The pace gets slowed way down with a camel clutch, but I like how Farouk begs for mercy when Ahmed lifts him up for an electric chair drop. The move hurts Ahmed more than Farouk though. Farouk is able to get back to his feet before Ahmed and he goes to the top rope. Ahmed counters the aerial attack with a power slam and the crowd loves it. Farouk hushes the audience by catching Ahmed afterwards and he hits a spine buster. Farouk then plays up to the audience and he begins bragging, but he doesn't notice that Ahmed has woke up and he's standing right behind him. Johnson gives Farouk a taste of his own medicine with a spine buster, and now it's time for the Pearl River Plunge. To ensure he doesn't take the move, Farouk calls for the nation to get involved, and now the referee calls for a disqualification. Ahmed has no issues taking out the whole faction, Farouk tries to escape up the rampway, and Ahmed tries to give chase, but he's stopped by a nation lackey. Ahmed decides to bring this poor guy to the French announce desk, and we see a Pearl River plunge through the table. The force makes the monitors sitting on the desk bounce in the air, and I thought this looked good too. This match gets totally ripped apart from the reviews I've read online, and I'm guessing that's because Ahmed Johnson automatically equals bad, but I thought this one was decent. The crowd absolutely loved it and they definitely helped to make it more fun to watch. 
The pace was just right for what was supposed to be a brawl and not a technical wonder. It'll never make anyone's top 50, but I've definitely seen way worse matches. Another brief backstage interview next. Terry Funk, who's gonna compete in tonight's Royal Rumble, says there's younger, faster, bigger and stronger wrestlers in the Royal Rumble tonight, but Funk is Texas bred and Texas fed. Fans should realize that Terry Funk was born to rumble. The Nation then get interviewed by Todd Pettengill and Farouk pulls two random Nation members in front of him and they both get tore apart for not helping during Farouk's match. This poor guy here really looks like he wants to go home. Farouk makes it clear that this rivalry with Ahmed Johnson is not over. Undertaker vs Vader should have felt bigger than what it was and it really comes down to the poor booking of Vader ever since SummerSlam 1996. The big man did get a big win over Bret Hart on Raw just a few weeks back but the focus was taken away from Vader when Psycho Sid attacked Jose's son afterwards. This feud with The Undertaker was plucked out of thin air also. Vader attacked The Undertaker during a promo that also featured Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels and Psycho Sid and on the next episode of Superstars, Taker hit the tombstone on Vader's manager, Jim Cornette. Cornette does not bring Vader down to the ring at the Royal Rumble and it appears that Cornette's association with Vader may be over. Taker's entrance is absolutely phenomenal as always. The two men share right hands at the opening bell and Vader quickly learns that The Undertaker is hard to put down. Just when Vader thinks he has the upper hand, the dead man keeps coming back. Three times The Undertaker is able to sit up after taking punishment from Vader and this causes Vader to leave the ring. He's clearly having second thoughts. We get more fighting at the entranceway and Taker briefly loses his advantage after getting back inside the ring. Vader drops the dead man's neck over the top rope, but then Taker comes back with a unique leg drop that almost looked like a Famouser. Taker then hits a body slam with ease. We then see a leg drop and The Undertaker goes for old school but Vader shakes the ropes, finally giving Vader an opportunity to maybe do some damage. Vader then hits a low blow in front of the referee and Jack Doan pretends he didn't see anything. Todd Pettengill interviews a complete random fan in the audience while the match is still playing out. This girl saved up her money to attend the Royal Rumble and for whatever reason it's just as important as the match inside the ring. Oh, everywhere. You saved your money doing what? Babysitting. Baby, how long did it take you? How many babies did you have to sit? During the interview, Vader absolutely destroyed The Undertaker with his signature forearm strikes. Taker then gets crushed in the opposite corner and the Phenom gets sent to the mat after a clothesline. Vader keeps the pressure on with an aerial attack but Taker kicks out at two. Vader then applies a nerve hold but it looks like he's having a nice little break in the middle of the ring. The Undertaker fires back with some of those quick punches. Vader takes a back suplex and then Undertaker misses a follow up elbow drop. Vader then hits a surprise powerbomb but The Undertaker kicks out. There's a good pop from the audience after the kick out but this kind of stuff in my opinion seriously watered down what Vader was all about. Taker gets right back up, he hits his jumping clothesline, we see old school and then Paul Bearer makes his way down to the ring as Taker hits a choke slam. Vader gets clotheslined over the top rope and The Undertaker finally gives Paul some payback for what happened at SummerSlam 96. Back inside the ring, Vader saves Bearer from taking a beating but The Undertaker fights off both men. Bearer then saves Vader near the guardrails and The Undertaker crashes hard and then Paul hits the dead man with the urn from the apron. All of this interference leads to Vader hitting a Vader bomb back inside the ropes and The Undertaker takes a loss at the 1997 Royal Rumble. Vader has now defeated Bret Hart and The Undertaker in the space of 30 days, yet he hasn't been elevated at all by these victories and it's all because of outside interference really. The dead man chokeslams the referee afterwards, Taker then approaches Vince McMahon at the announce table and the dead man says there's a storm heading to the World Wrestling Federation and its name is The Undertaker. Yeah, this is okay but you could skip over it. Taker and Vader would have a better match on pay per view in just a few months time. Paul Bear would now also serve as Vader's manager. Steve Austin says he's not talking to anyone until he throws 29 pieces of trash over the top rope. 
so the cameraman can take his camera and stick it. We get an absolute classic next when Davy Boy Smith tells us why he's going to win the Royal Rumble tonight. This night's Royal Rumble tonight because I'm bizarre! We then got a six-man tag featuring superstars from the AAA promotion, Hector Garza, Kinect and Perry Aguayo, taking on Fuerza Guerrera, Heavy Metal and Jerry Estrada. The WWF fans in attendance took this time to get snacks and use the toilet before the Royal Rumble. A lot of moving bodies can be seen in the audience. WCW cruiserweights were stealing the show on Monday nights and I'm not so sure a match like this would have been featured on a WWF pay-per-view if the WCW cruiserweights weren't doing such a good job. But yeah, nobody in the crowd is invested at all because these guys have never been exposed to WWF audiences. The babyface team gets the win in the end. Some great looking moves during this one, but the guys in the ring were in a tough position too. WCW had the cream of the crop when it came to luchadors on American television. And let's not forget, fans in the Alamo Dome already saw three AAA matches during the free for all. The crowd was silent during this one and it's quite entertaining listening to Vince McMahon trying to commentate during the bout. And now it's time for the Royal Rumble match. The winner is scheduled to take on the WWF Champion at WrestleMania 13 and the smart money says the WWF Champion heading into Mania will be the winner of tonight's Shawn Michaels vs Psycho Sid match. The number one entrant is Crush and the number two entrant is Ahmed Johnson. So the Nation vs Ahmed feud continues in the Royal Rumble match. Crush gets the better of Ahmed to start off with but Johnson comes back and the two men roll around on the mat while trying to do some damage. Crush then tries to eliminate Johnson but he's unsuccessful. Our next entrant is the fake Razor Ramon. The countdown clock didn't show up here and Vince McMahon says there's some difficulties with the timer. Only in the WWF during this time period could a clock somehow get screwed up. Razor gets eliminated almost immediately by Ahmed Johnson and that's it guys. Say goodbye to the bad guy because this was Rick Bogner's final TV appearance in the WWF. The end of an era. Ahmed goes back to work on Crush but then Johnson decides to eliminate himself when he sees Farouk. Ahmed jumps over the top rope and he chases Farouk back up the rampway, so Crush is left all alone as we wait for entrant number 4. Why Ahmed didn't just slide under the ropes is anyone's guess, but anyway, here comes Phineas Godwin with all his hopes and dreams of main eventing Wrestlemania. The lack of a countdown clock seriously hurts the viewing experience because you don't get to see and hear the crowd counting down to the next entrant. It's incredible how such a small thing makes a lot of difference. Entrant number 5 is Stone Cold Steve Austin and Phineas goes straight to work on the rattlesnake. Austin decides to form an alliance with Crush but that doesn't last long. A failed clothesline attempt leads to Crush getting eliminated and immediately afterwards Phineas takes a Stone Cold Stunner and the Hog Farmer gets eliminated. The countdown clock appeared too during these eliminations so now it really feels like a Royal Rumble. Bart Gunn is out next and Austin initially has a hard time dealing with the former smoking gun but it doesn't take long for Bart to make a mistake. Gunn gets sent over the top rope and now Stone Cold is feeling confident. Austin performs a few push ups in the middle of the ring and he sits on the top turnbuckles waiting for the next entrant. Royal Rumble veteran Jake the Snake Roberts is out next and Jake doesn't have that many dates left in the WWF either. He's got one more TV appearance on Shotgun Saturday night and it's a very grim appearance. And then that's it, he's gone too. Give him credit though, the fans were still chanting for the DDT as Jake went to work on Austin's wrist. Jake manages to survive for 90 seconds and we see his elimination on the entrance screen as number 8 makes his way down to the ring, the bizarre British Bulldog. Does he have the balls to pull off a chin lock inside the Royal Rumble match? Let's find out. Bulldog and Austin have had problems for a few weeks now on Raw which has sort of led to Bret Hart supporting his brother-in-law. Austin attacked Davey from behind and he hit a stunner on the Bulldog on the previous episode of Raw so there's animosity here between these two men. Bulldog destroys Austin, Stone Cold takes a running power slam just before the next entrant hits the ring and it's Piroth from AAA. There's a real awkward clash of styles here with the AAA guys and the WWF guys and it's very noticeable in the selling. No alliances here, everyone is an enemy. Bulldog and Austin briefly team up to take care of Piroth 
and then Bulldog goes straight back to attacking Steve Austin. Entrant number 10 then hits the ring, it's the Sultan. The Iron Sheik is here too, no Bob Backlund, and I kinda wish it was the Iron Sheik who was getting inside the ring. Following the Sultan we have the legendary Mil Mascaris, and those who know the story here will have fun with this one. Let's wait until he gets eliminated. Mascaris gets a great reaction, though the fans know who he is. Hunter Hearst Helmsley comes out next and he goes to work on Davy Boy Smith. The ring has started to fill up a little now as we've got 6 guys inside the ropes, fighting for a chance to main event WrestleMania 13. 6 becomes 5 when Davy Boy Smith eliminates the Sultan with a clothesline over the top rope. Out next is the King of Hearts, Owen Hart. Owen goes straight after Austin but it doesn't take long for Stone Cold to turn things around. Davy Boy Smith comes to Owen's aid, and this results in Davy almost eliminating Stone Cold, but Owen comes from behind and he eliminates the British Bulldog. The tag team champions begin arguing, Owen says it was an accident but clearly it wasn't. Davy gets really hot on the outside but he's forced to the locker room by officials. Next out we have Goldust, and following Goldust we have Triple A's Cybernetico. Cybernetico goes straight after Mil Mascaris and Goldust eventually goes after Triple H. So Mark Merrow comes out next and Cybernetico gets eliminated by Pierroth. Mil Mascaris then eliminates Pierroth and Mascaris decides to dive from the top rope down to the floor, so Mascaris eliminated himself. What happened here was Mel Mascaris wasn't prepared to look weak and get eliminated by anyone, so the only person who could possibly eliminate the legendary Mel Mascaris was Mel Mascaris himself. Also, Mascaris technically went through the middle rope before climbing up, but that's irrelevant. The story here is that Mascaris really felt that getting thrown over the top rope by a WWF guy would make him look weak, so he threw himself out. Fantastic. Ross and McMahon say that Mil Mascaris made a mental error and he doesn't understand the rules, so while Mascaris may have saved himself from getting eliminated by an opponent, he didn't save himself from looking fucking stupid. Goldust eliminates Triple H, so we have 4 men left in the ring before entrance 17 comes down. Latin Lover is our final Triple A wrestler to enter the Royal Rumble. The first thing he does when getting into the ring, he literally kicks Goldust's ass. Latin Lover then hits Owen Hart with a super kick and Goldust reminds Double L where he is by punching him in the face. Goldust tries to eliminate Owen, Owen survives by skinning the cat, and the King of Hearts comes back in to eliminate Goldust. Out next is Farouk, the leader of the nation eliminates Latin Lover before having a wild fist fight with Stone Cold Steve Austin. But here comes Ahmed Johnson holding the largest, most impractical 2x4 you've ever seen in your life. Farouk jumps over the top rope to escape Ahmed, and in the middle of all of this commotion, Steve Austin eliminated both Owen Hart and Mark Merrow, though the cameras didn't catch the eliminations. Out next we have Austin's old rival Savio Vega and another fist fight breaks out in the middle of the ring. Austin uses Savio's momentum against him, and Savio doesn't last long inside the Royal Rumble. Austin is once again left all alone, and he's looking really good tonight inside the Alamo Dome. The real Double J Jesse James is our 20th entrant. James gets in a few rights and lefts and he hits a clothesline in the corner, but he has to do his little strut. Don't ever give Steve Austin a chance to strike because Austin will take the opportunity and it won't be pretty. James gets thrown out of the ring, he tries to stay in but a back elbow sends Jesse to the outside, and just like that, Stone Cold is once again left all alone waiting for the next competitor. Out comes Bret the Hitman Hart, the favourite to win the Royal Rumble match, and the Hitman gets to work by making Steve Austin go through yet another fist fight. The audience stands on their feet as Bret gets the upper hand. Austin begs for mercy in the corner, but Bret is promised to do unto others tonight. Hart has talked about how the WWF is now a land without law, and Bret's happy to work inside this new landscape. While Bret applies a sharpshooter, the 22nd entrant gets revealed. It's commentator Jerry the King Lawler. King lasts all of 4 seconds. There's a great pop when Bret uppercuts Lawler over the top rope, and Jerry resumes his commentary duties immediately after getting eliminated. 
Brett goes back to work on Austin before our next entrant comes out, the fake Diesel. Glenn Jacobs here would set Royal Rumble records as the Kane character, but right here, and I'm just being honest, he feels like a waste of a Royal Rumble spot. Diesel attacks Brett as soon as he gets in the ring and Steve Austin also feels the wrath of Big Daddy Cool. Brett dislikes Steve Austin so much that he actually tries to help Diesel eliminate the rattlesnake, but that doesn't work out too well. Terry Funk enters the Royal Rumble and he goes straight after Steve Austin. These two mixed it up a little on Shotgun Saturday night and it was great. Here in the Royal Rumble, the two men go at it and there's very little reaction. It's kinda surprising really. There are a few fans from Amarillo though and they brought a big banner for the Funker. Good stuff. Number 25 is Rocky Maivia making his Royal Rumble debut and check it out, the first person he attacks, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Rock keeps the pressure on Austin while Brett tries to eliminate Terry Funk. Diesel just stands there. Mankind is our next entrant and Jim Ross points out that we're gonna have Bret Hart, Steve Austin, Mick Foley and Terry Funk all in the ring at the same time and anything could happen. Mankind goes after Funk, Brett and Austin slug it out and Diesel tries to eliminate Rocky Maivia. No eliminations happen by the time our next entrant enters the match, Flash Funk. Bret Hart lands a pile driver on Steve Austin while Flash Funk takes out Terry and Diesel with a crossbody. Terry also gets choked by Mankind's boot and you can feel the crowd getting on edge here as we approach the final moments of the 1997 Royal Rumble. Number 28 is the man they call Vader. Bret Hart gets annihilated by the big man and Vader also makes quick work of Flash Funk and Steve Austin. Stone Cold runs into a brick wall here. We have 8 men in the match as Hart tries to get a little payback on Vader. Henry Godwin comes out next and again we have no eliminations. Meaning that there's 10 men in the ring after number 30 makes his entrance, The Undertaker. Taker goes straight after Vader, picking up where we left off earlier in the show. The dead man then attacks Mankind before hitting choke slams on both Vader and Steve Austin. The Phenom is looking really good here. Vader gets up and he eliminates Flash Funk. The replay picks the elimination up better than the live footage. The Undertaker then eliminates Henry Godwin. Rocky Maivia finds himself in the mandible claw before Mankind dumps him over the top rope. Mankind then eliminates Terry Funk with a suplex before Foley gets eliminated by The Undertaker. And then Mankind and Terry Funk begin fighting on the outside, keeping the referees busy as the rumble match continues. Bret Hart eliminates Stone Cold Steve Austin, the crowd pops, but the referees don't see the elimination. Stone Cold gets back into the ring and he eliminates Vader and The Undertaker just as Bret eliminates the fake Diesel. And then Steve Austin throws Bret Hart over the top rope and Stone Cold Steve Austin is announced the winner of the 1997 Royal Rumble. Bret Hart is pissed. Stone Cold walks back up the entranceway leaving Bret Hart alone to complain to anyone who'll listen. Brett tells the referees he eliminated Austin, the hitman goes over and he complains to Vince McMahon about the finish of the match, but the referee's decision is final tonight, there's no replay rule in the WWF. Steve Austin goes into the history books as the winner of the 1997 Royal Rumble, and as for Brett, well, he's gonna make a pretty big decision tomorrow night on Raw. The ending of the match would really play into Brett's upcoming heel turn, an injustice was done to the hitman once again, he has every right to complain, but Brett was also coming across as a crybaby. I know most people don't think too highly of this rumble match and I can definitely see why, but personally I don't mind it as much as others. The match really picks up towards the last 10 minutes or so and the finish was really well done. Steve Austin winning the whole thing was a great move also. The rise of Stone Cold Steve Austin continues on WWF television. HBK lost the WWF Championship back at Survivor Series when Sid attacked Jose Lothario with a camera. HBK got booed out of the building, fans were seemingly tired of the white meat babyface Shawn Michaels and the MSG audience went crazy for Psycho Sid. Since then, the WWF done all they could to make Sid a full blown heel while trying to make Shawn a little more rough around the edges. Vince McMahon even called Shawn a real man's man on WWF TV. And HBK went out of his way to tell everyone that he doesn't really care if the fans cheer him or boo him. 
no matter what happens during a WWF card, Sean says he always gives the best performance of the night. Sid made things a little more personal when he attacked Jose Lothario's son on Raw, so you had a few things going on here that swayed some fans into backing Shawn Michaels over Psycho Sid. Many fans were still tired of Shawn, but not those in San Antonio. HBK was going to get a hero's welcome tonight. We see a Superstars interview with Sean beforehand and HBK announces he isn't feeling well. He's got a flu, but he's still going to perform tonight inside the ring. Why the WWF announced this, I do not know. Maybe they wanted an insurance policy in case the match was awful. But keep in mind that Sean is apparently sick when you see the match result. We see Sean and Jose backstage walking towards the entranceway. HBK's theme music plays in the arena and the crowd lose their minds. Man, if this guy really has a flu, then that's a lot of hands he's touching on the way to the ring. Still, it's a hometown welcome here for the heartbreak kid, and he seems to have a lot more confidence here in comparison to how he looked during Superstars. Amazing what some <coughs> medicine can do. Sid walks into enemy territory here, but to be fair, he does have some fans in the Alamo Dome. Not a huge lot when compared to the Garden, but you do see a few fans during the match who want Sid to win. I'm sure a lot of fans watching on pay-per-view wanted to see Sid win also. The champion pushes the challenger down to the mat and Sean smiles as he walks straight back to Psycho Sid. Sid decides he isn't going to play tonight and he goes straight on the attack. He screams at Sean's parents sitting at ringside before landing a big clubbing blow but HBK comes back with a crossbody. The crowd pops as Sean rocks Sid's head repeatedly on the mat. Sid gets booted out of the ring and the match continues on the outside. Sid ends up lifting Sean up for a press slam but HBK rakes Sid's eyes. This allows HBK to throw Sid back inside the ropes and try an aerial attack. The champ grabs Sean in mid-air and we see a power slam, and then the pace slows way down when Sid locks in not just one camel clutch, but three camel clutches. It feels like an absolute eternity, but the fans in the audience make a lot of noise, hoping HBK can somehow get out of this hold. Sean dodges a sit-down attack and the audience pops. Sean's offensive flurry gives the crowd a reason to keep cheering for HBK, but Sean ends up taking the flare corner bump and there's a hush in the Alamo Dome. Sid doesn't give Sean time to recuperate. HBK gets his back rammed into the ring post twice before the match continues in the ring. Jose tries to cheer Michaels back into the match, but maybe Sid is unbeatable tonight in San Antonio. Anytime Sean begins to build offense, Sid puts him right back down. And give it to Psycho Sid here, he knows the crowd is largely against him and he plays up to it brilliantly. A bear hug gets applied in the middle of the ring and Sean's parents watch on as HBK tries to fight out of another hold. The bear hug gets applied twice and you can tell that the match is getting slowed down for HBK's benefit. Still, the crowd doesn't care. Anytime Sean breaks a hold, they go nuts. And the match has been laid out in a way that gives the fans a reason to pop multiple times. The third bear hug gets applied after Sean tries a second rope clothesline. It's kept held in for an extended period of time as Sid brings it right down to the mat. The big man then hits a leg drop and Sid keeps it on the canvas as Sean tries to fight out of another submission hold. HBK counters a scoop slam with a slam of his own. We then see Sean's flying forearm. Michaels heads to the top rope and he lands his elbow drop. This all happens very suddenly. Sean then tries to finish it, he goes for the super kick, but Sid grabs his foot and Sean ends up getting thrown to the outside. Sid then lands a power bomb, and that should do it. All Sid has to do is throw Sean back into the ring and it's all over. But he decides to go after Jose Lothario. This leads to Jose's son jumping the guardrail and Sid could have destroyed both these guys, but Pat Patterson manages to calm Sid down. The match resumes in the ring and the referee gets taken out. Sid lands a choke slam immediately afterwards. He has Sean beat, but there's no one there to count the pin. A second referee runs down, but Sean kicks out at two. Sid takes out the second referee. Jose Lothario jumps on the apron, and this gives Sean the opportunity to grab a camera. HBK gets revenge for Survivor Series by destroying Sid with the camera. He pins the champ, but Sid kicks out. Sean gets back to his feet, he nails sweet chin music, 
Earl Hebner gives one of his classic slow three counts and it's all over. Shawn Michaels becomes a two-time WWF champion. Just like that, Sid's run as champion comes to an end. And coming out of this pay-per-view, fans would think that we're going to see a Steve Austin vs Shawn Michaels WrestleMania main event, although some drastic changes get made very soon, so make sure to check out Reliving the War to see it all unfold. HBK celebrates with his family and friends at ringside before the show goes off the air. I thought the 1996 Survivor Series match was better and much of that has to do with the New York audience. You can definitely tell Shawn isn't 100% here also, but either way, a sick Shawn Michaels is still a good performer. It's definitely a match that would have been good to see live in the Alamo Dome, the atmosphere looks great, but as a TV viewing experience, it does fall short of their previous encounter. I used to really like this pay-per-view for some reason, but watching it back, it's just okay. There's good moments here and there, you can still feel a change happening in the WWF, particularly with the opening matches and how they're laid out, but the end result just isn't as good as it could have been. The undercard matches were a letdown, but to be fair also, I was quite surprised by the Ahmed vs Farouk match, it wasn't as bad as I remember it. The final moments of the Rumble were great too, and I also like when a story gets told in the Rumble match itself, so points there for the finish. Sid vs Sean was definitely a passable main event, it's just not as good as Survivor Series 96. I'd say give the Farouk match a rewatch just for the sake of it, not a technical masterpiece at all, but it might be better than you remember. And check out the last 15 minutes or so of the Rumble match. The Royal Rumble pay-per-view also being held in a dome is quite interesting and it does give the show a much bigger feeling. It's quite an oddity after coming out of 1996 in some incredibly small Raw and in your house venues, so credit to the World Wrestling Federation for filling up the Alamo Dome, even if it wasn't all paid customers inside the venue. Anyway, thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this look back at the first WWF pay-per-view of 1997 and I'll see you all on Thursday for Reliving the War.